All right, once again, good morning. morning. Welcome to Calvary Fellowship. It's a beautiful day out there today. And that was some beautiful worship. I love that song. You guys doing good? Yes. Ready to start a new book this morning? We're going to start 2 Peter today. We're going to get right into it because I've got some stuff I want to tell you about this encouraging from Peter. So I'll be reading from the New King James. We're going to be in chapter 1 today. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it's right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased." And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you, do, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prof- prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, Peter saw a window that you provided for him, a brief moment where he continued to chase after the call you had given his life, the purpose, Lord, that he served, that is the flock. He took a moment once, one more time before he died to speak to us, to warn us, to encourage us. Lord, let our hearts always be that way. Lord, as we face this world and this world now is turned towards us, we ask you to make us bold like Peter. Let his word speak to our heart. Holy Spirit, we ask you to set the things you want us to learn in our hearts and minds today. And we ask you to come and teach now, Holy Spirit. Let me decrease that you may increase in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, most people believe that 2 Peter was written before his death. I think we would all agree on that. But as I'm going to point out here in the next few minutes, there's a lot of angst, if you will, about when it was done. Discussion by non-conservative scholars especially who think the book's length was short and because of that, it probably was not widely viewed at the time it came out. 
And it says he put it out. And acceptance, I'm sure, came slowly. And it came slowly because if you remember, Paul had warned about that. There were people writing letters in the names of the apostles. And so they were being very diligent and slow and careful about anything that had an apostle's name on it, and they should have been. And there were people who pointed out slight differences between the two books. And so they used that as a place to say, well, this couldn't be from Peter because the stylistic differences are too great. So there's some of that going on as well. But over the centuries, there have been scholars who've continued to pile onto that and create more doubt. Now, 2 Peter was included in the Latin Vulgate by Jerome. So when Jerome put together what we now know as the New Testament, and he started compiling things, he included it. He recognized it as canon scripture. And there were those who were surprised that while he recognized it in the Latin Vulgate, that he also recognized there were people who had a problem with it. And so that's been acknowledged, but it's in the scripture because the Holy Spirit said it's in the scripture. And so this is Peter's last minute note to us to give us more encouragement and more warning because of some things he saw. Now, at this time in history when this was written, um, Nero was attempting, as we talked about in 1 Peter, to crush Christianity. If you guys remember, we talked about that. And uh, there was a convergence of warnings, both from Paul and from Peter. And those warnings are hitting us right now today as, as a church. Um, one argument that they used to try to trip up Peter's second writing here is the mention of Paul's writings in chapter 3. And they also talk about the specific, uh, specifically the delay of the Lord's return in chapter 3 also. They try to argue that there was a later author who wrote it, and there's, a, there's talk about Jude. But in the time of Peter and Paul's death, that convergence that came together leads me to believe that they both saw what was happening, and they both wrote about it, specifically 2 Timothy, which I'll get to in a second, from Paul, and then Peter here. Scholars believe that Peter and Paul were in Rome together. And they both were executed one day apart. And if you've ever been to Rome and been to the Vatican, you'll see they have a place inside of the Basilica there, St. Peter's, where you see the spot where they think they both were martyred. Now, we don't know that for a fact, but I'll take it as a fact because there were enough people in Rome that would have seen it, and there were believers there. So no one has come forward to contradict that. So we don't know if they were one day in the next. Some movies have said that, but that is what has been spoken. Now the second letter from Peter lends some credence to the allegations that, this in, that he was being held in Israel, which we talked about before, and even maybe he was held in actual Babylon, which I won't get into that, until his arrival in Rome for execution. But he's in Rome now, this time, and he knows that. There's no documents that actually back this up. You know, we always wanna have some kind of record, right? But the Romans kept pretty good records. I used to joke with people and say, you know, my, my people keep good records. But the Romans, as, as a whole, had some notice, some things written down. And when the church split and went east and west, things were lost. So we have this record from Peter. He also, let me just, let me, let me just touch on something here. Peter looked down through the ages and he saw the trouble that was coming. He wasn't just talking to them in the Roman times. He was talking to us. Because if you remember, he was asked by Jesus, do you love me? And he said, feed my sheep. Remember? We are the sheep of Jesus' fold. So Peter's looking down through the ages to talk to us about this. He made an effort to get the word out. Not just to encourage us, but to get the word out on false teachers and to speak to the damage that they were doing to the flock then and now, just like Paul was doing. You've heard me mention Dr. Walford before from the Dallas Theological Seminary. He said this, First Peter deals with dangers from outside, outsiders hostile to the Christian community. Second Peter examines the dangers emerging from within, warning us about the same problems the emergence of false teachers and of false teaching. 
So as we get into this this morning, the apostle starts his letter with a greeting of encouragement as he always does, but he gets to business pretty quick. So if you'll look with me in chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 1 and 2, he identifies himself by saying, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. There's no question who wrote this. He identifies himself so we can rest assured in scripture that this was Peter giving us one last glimpse, one last moment. And I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about that as we get towards the end here. <clears throat> but he's talking to those who've obtained, like us, precious faith. Who is he talking to? Now, I've heard that question come up many times. First Peter kind of lays it out. Paul lays it out also in Galatians chapter 2, verse 7, as I shared with you last week, where he says, But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. Peter spoke to the Jewish community mostly. He did talk to Gentiles. We have some evidence that he may have been in Corinth and other places, but he mostly was in Israel ministering to Jews. And as they were getting saved and converted, he pastored them as well as James, who was the bishop of Jerusalem. And so he was talking to them. Remember, Judaizers in that time, people who had been saved were bringing the traditions over from Judaism and trying to hold parts of the law. We have that happening right now today. They're called Hebrew roots, and we have to be careful of that because either you're under the law or you're not. We're under grace. The apostles addressed that in Acts chapter 15, and we'll go back sometime and take a look at that again. But his audience and the faith that he's talking about here is faith in Yeshua, our Messiah. He's talking about the faith in your king has come. And you know, for somebody who is Jewish, I can tell you this from having had conversations with close friends who are Jewish, and they'll tell you, faith in Christ, they lose everything. They lose family, they lose community, they lose everything. So, Peter's talking to people who've had to go from zero again. And he's encouraging them. And, but, but he's also talking to us. He tells us, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. You know, Paul did a really good job of doing that too in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 when he said, or chapter 1 verse 20 when he said, for all the promises of God in him are yes and in him Amen, for the glory of God through us. You know that song, all his promises are yes and amen. You guys know that. Look at the ladies are like, yeah, it's on Joy FM. <laughs> it's on K-Love too. Our promises are in him. Our predestined glory is in him. Our salvation is in him. And Peter's taking one more opportunity here. Something I probably should have said, or maybe I've said it already, but I'm going to say it again. Peter is en route to his death. We don't know if there was a brief, weak pause. They wanted to wait till Paul got there so they could make it a double header. I don't know. Get it? Double header? Anyway, I, I know. Thank you. It's Labor Day. Anyway, when this, this, this delay happened, Peter really decided, I've got to get something else out. I've got to warn the flock. That burning in his bones like Jeremiah had is how we should be in these last minutes because we see what's coming. In verses 3 and 4, he said, through the knowledge of Christ who called us by glory and virtue and by his divine power, he has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, those exceedingly great and precious promises in him. So what has he promised us? I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be also. That you will be with me forever. You are the sheep of my fold and you hear my voice and follow me. I will protect you. I will carry you. I will come for you. I will be there for you. He's never said anything to us that he hasn't done. Somewhere in our lives, if we look back just for a moment at a place where we were having a rough time, we can see his handprints, his fingerprints. We can see it. The problem is, as a human, we just 
Forget that. We tend to live emotionally in the moment, right? He's reminding us that because we are partakers of that divine nature, we've escaped the corruption that worldly lusts bring. Now, does that mean we've escaped temptation? No. We're tempted, aren't we? Anything you had in your past, Satan's going to bring right back to the front of you. He's going to continue to do it until you leave this earth. Peter was no different. You guys remember Peter was very docile and saintly and he stood around with a halo over his head. He never cut anybody's ear off. He never swore like a sailor because he was a sailor. He was a fisherman. Peter had come a long way when this moment happened. And Peter's saying to them, look at the change in me. I'm not going to tell you about Jesus because he'll change your life. And people are like, oh, now i got to know about it. Peter's moment here, his heart, is trying to encourage us to be fruitful in our growth in Christ. He tells us in verses 5 to 7 to be diligent, to be committed, and to be serious. Be serious in our growth in Jesus. And he tells us to live with a high moral standard. If you stop and think about our society today, do we actually live with, in a society that has high moral standards? We think we do. But we look back, let's just say 70 years. Is there a stark difference? How about in this country in the last five years? Five years. Two years. Anybody want to go six months? How about last week? We have accepted sin as normalcy now. We have decided that we're going to put our faith in people rather than the king. We're looking to people instead of the king. The devil has succeeded in turning our heads. And we have to listen to Peter here. If we live with high moral standards, he says, add to those high standards a deep and highly developed understanding of Christ. How does that happen? By getting into this. You know, there's theologians and scholars that have all those, like I said last week, they have a wall covered in paper, of all the things that they've studied. But are they taking us into this to study? Not a lot. Society bears it out. So places where we can get together and get in the word and study the word. He says, grow in that deep understanding. Wrestle with words that you don't understand. Don't just take somebody's word for it. That's how false teachers blossom. He says, exercise control of your emotions or impulses that corrupt us. We have to have control of that. We're very emotional people, aren't we? Oh my goodness. Just watch television for two seconds. Everything's about your emotions. How do you feel? How do you smell? How do you look? What's your hair like? You don't have any hair. We can help you grow hair now. You don't have any eyebrows? We can tattoo those on. We're more worried about feely, touchy things than we are about our relationship with Christ. And we've got to get back. The church corporately has to get back to center. And Peter's encouraging us. He says, hang in there despite the degree of difficulty that hinders you. We do have a degree of difficulty hindering us, whether you realize it or not. This world we live in, specifically this country right this minute, they'll do just about anything to keep us from having a relationship with Christ because we want what we want. What we need to do is grab the hem of his garment. That lady had the faith enough to get to the edge of that crowd and just knowing I can just touch him. And he will heal me. Can you imagine what he'll do with our lives if we do that? What will he do with his church if we reach for the hem of his garment? Peter says, I'll tell you what he'll do. He'll show up. He said, seek godliness. Exercise compassion and mercy. Here's the big one. Patience. That's a hard one, huh? Don't ever pray for that, by the way. I did it once. Once. He says, (laughs) obviously somebody who's been on that same road that I've been on before, right? (laughs) She's like, oh yeah. 
displaying a deep affection for one another. What does that mean? You know, we are called to be family. We're to bear each other's burdens. We're to love one another. We're to help each other and step in. But you know something? Our society today says don't do that because somebody's going to put your business out in the street. They've been doing that forever. That's not new. Now, though, you run the risk of if you say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing or if I say COVID on a video, I'm probably going to get censored on YouTube. Thank God for rumble. If you do anything that goes against the grain of those who finally gain control of the country we live in right this minute, shut you down. It seems to be churches are the target, number, number one target. Those who are teaching the word of God. Brothers and sisters, honestly, all they had was each other then. And we need to look around because you know what? When it all goes down here in not too distant future, we're only going to have each other. And we're going to have to depend on each other. Peter says, it's coming. Put your arms around each other. Hold each other's hands. Let the little things go. So you don't like the fact that I wear shoes with white bottoms on them. I don't care. They're comfortable. Let that go. Little things that we let become big things in our lives have got to move aside so that we can form loving and lasting relationships. Do you realize there are people right this minute looking around for a place that's getting in the word because they're hungry? I'm going to talk about it. I got numbers. You know me and stats, right? I got some stats for you. That's happening right now, and Peter saw that. The world in which we live in right this minute is just as bad as the world they were living in. And the persecution that they faced by the then world emperor Nero is nothing like what's coming in the tribulation period shortly. But praise God, we won't be there. Right? I used to joke about being able to drive my truck and then hopefully I'm raptured. Now my daughter's driving my truck, so it'll be a Honda. It won't make much damage. Sorry. <laughs> God's like, I'll fix you. I'll put you in a little car. Clown car. E -e -e. Verse 8, he says, For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is who we are supposed to know more intimately. Peter's encouraging us with that. And he continues in verse 9 and shifts gears real quick here. He really just like, you know, hangs a left, if you will. Because here we see the traits of a backslider described by the apostle. The one who lacks these things has taken these things we just talked about, that we just listed, has taken them for granted. And they've possibly been blinded, hello, say that twice, blinded by sin. Do we see evidence of that? Am I just speaking out loud? Or do we see evidence of people who we thought were Christian that are blinded by sin today? How in the world can we embrace in churches the things that we're embracing now? How? Those are questions that the Holy Spirit wants to deal with each one of us on. But if we're not in the Word and we're not praying and we're not having fellowship with each other, it's easy to try to avoid that conviction. And he's warning us about that. They've forgotten the blood that cleansed them from their old sins and the price that was paid for our salvation. We have to encourage them to go back to the foot of the cross. You know, when we sin, when we do something wrong, at least I do, I confess it right then. I just get it straight right then. Because it affects me. Let me encourage you to be that way. When something's affected, when you've done something right then, don't wait for the, you know, the apology that comes when you get caught. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to back into your car. You left. You had to get it off the camera and get your tag number, right? That's a bad example, but you follow what I'm saying rather than having integrity and stopping right there and dealing with it. That's a small example of something where we can get it straight to start with. Jesus, I looked at someone in lust. Jesus, I coveted money. Please forgive me. And he will. He told us in his scripture that he will. But see, these people are not just backslidden. Listen to what John says about them in 1 John. 
chapter 2, verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, then they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. You guys realize that right now, God is preparing a hard shaking for the body of Christ. I've been warning you about it for months, and it's coming. And when the shaking happens, we're going to see this. We're seeing it already. We're seeing massive denominations just splitting all over the place over sin. That shouldn't even be a question. But that's just one thing that's happening. We've got people calling themselves Christians that are upholding some of the most horrendous sins in the world and defending people's right to choose over life. That's just one. Peter encourages us to check those sins and not be like them. And he actually, in verses 10 to 11, he tells us to be committed in making our call and election sure, to be diligent in our walk. Our election, how many times has that word been used incorrectly or in improper and uh, uh, not proper context? These verses, these two verses, 10 and 11, are where some theologians and denominations make the leap that only a few are selected, them. Jesus said, if you lift me up, I will call all men unto me. Draw all men unto me. He said, and those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Old Testament and New Testament, he says it. He's very clear about it. Peter says it's important to do the things he just mentioned a couple verses ago. And if we do these things, we will never stumble and not fall away. And if we're diligent in these things, we'll be welcomed into the everlasting kingdom. When you share the gospel with someone, these promises are laid out very quickly and succinctly by Peter here. Don't be afraid to take them into the scripture and show it to them. You know when people are asking you questions and you start thinking, where is that in John? I gotta go to John. We've been conditioned to everything's in John. John's a great place to take people, but you know what? We've studied Revelation. You can take people to Revelation. Don't be afraid of that. They might be afraid of it, but don't be afraid of it. Or what about here? Here's a perfect example. Peter says, if you do these things, you're solid, but be cautious. He wasted no time in getting this one more letter of warning out. But he didn't just get it out to his flock. He got it out to the body, and that's us today. And now he's going to shift to some stark warnings and the warning of his demise. He talks about his death, verse 12. He's warning them in writing of his death, his impending death. And he has a few things that he wants to get right to. Why? Because of the ongoing and destructive work of false prophets. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but are we seeing a lot of false prophets out there today? Social media is full of them. It's hard. You have to discern and you have to listen to find truth. You have to be willing to listen to someone more than once to understand if they're speaking truth from Scripture or not. He tells us in verses 13 and 14 that as long as he's in his tent, he's in this body, this human body, it's right to stir you up, he says. It's right for me to wake you up flock. That's what he's saying. And remind you that shortly I must die and leave this body just as Jesus told me. That's a prophetic speaking that Jesus gave him. You're going to die for my name. But he said we were going to suffer for your name. It's my fault. I turned it down. That's why it's cold. So I hop cold in here, I know. Feels good up here though. I'm sorry. Sorry, Rosie. It's my fault. <laughs> I saw Lori jump up. I'm like, oh, I turned the air down too far. Peter tells us why that this is written down for us. Verse 15, moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. His words are going on parchment and they're going to live past his death. We have it right here. We have the words from the apostle 
who stood in the presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who was the recipient of his grace abundantly. Remember? You will deny me three times. I'll die for you. No. And he did it, didn't he? Look at the grace that he has. How much more grace, Peter says, does he have for you and for me? Now, from as far back as Alexander the Great, the Greek and Roman Empire citizenry both had a belief that when an execution happened, that person went to Hades. Did you know that? So if somebody was executed, they must have been bad, and they went to Hades. And only the emperors themselves joined the immortals or the gods that they worshipped. And there were a few, rare few, heroic figures that went with them. So you got to put something in context here. Peter's talking to a society that, what's the word I'm looking for? They're, they're, not, they're not people of faith. Why can't I ever think of these words when I'm trying to do something? I should write them down. He's talking to people who worship Mars, Mercury, who worship all these gods and these people, and they, even though they're statues, they still worship them, and they have Greek mythology and all this stuff going on. That heresy made its way into the church. And that begat, that heresy did, a practice called indulgences. You guys familiar with that? The Roman Catholic Church developed the practice of charging families money to release their family members from hell. Look, then or today, it doesn't matter. There's always somebody looking to make some money off the people. I don't believe they have that practice going anymore and haven't for a couple hundred years, but you cannot buy your way out of hell. Jesus already paid that price with his precious blood on that cross and his resurrection sealed the deal. And you know what? That's it. So all those people who paid money in to get their family members moved out of purgatory into paradise, I hate to break this to you, but it didn't happen. They have no power to do that. And I came up in that faith. So I understood it, even though it didn't happen anymore. And that was something that was practiced and it was societal then. It became a practice of the church later. That was an early form of false teaching, which was one of many things that needed to be addressed by Peter, he said. And at the end of their lives, both Peter and Paul also were keenly aware of the false teachings that had corrupted the flock. Paul dealt with it a lot. Paul always had to write a letter after he'd been to a town because somebody would come in and be a fraud. Or in some places, he came in and they ran him out of town because there had been frauds there already. So see, having these false prophets and YouTube pastors is not new. It's not new. It's just getting more visibility now because we have social media. Later, letters that came later on in the New Testament era show a growing awareness of the dangers that faced that young church. Like I said in 2 Timothy, the last letter that Paul wrote before he died, he had a grim warning about false teachers and a growing pollution of the church. And now in two other late letters, one written by Peter, this one, and in Jude, we discover the same strong note of warning. In 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 to 5, listen to, listen to Paul's instruction to Timothy. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things and endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. He wasn't just talking to to Timothy. He was talking to you and me. We have to be diligent and discern. We have to pay attention. <clears throat> We're in the same place, like I said a minute ago, in this country today, and so many are fascinated. Do you know people are more fascinated with Antichrist than they are with Jesus Christ? There are more people out there looking for answers on Antichrist than they are getting in the Scripture. They're okay with the cultural Christianity check in the box. I went and heard three-point three sermon today about how 
uh, I can feel better or how my money will work for me as long as I tithe or as long as I do this or do that. You know, <clears throat> I know we all want to go home feeling good on Sunday. We all want to feel like we did something. But do you know, it's not always easy getting in the Word of God and letting it work in your heart, is it? And when you study the Word of God, it's not always fun because it gets on our toes. And false prophets try to figure out a way to get emotion. I'm going to bring that back in, in there. And I'm not mocking how some people preach, but if I had a washcloth and I ran around and jumped on this stage and hooted and hollered and everything else, would that be exciting for you? Maybe for a minute or two. Or do we let the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts? Now, some people appreciate that kind of preaching, and I'm not making fun of it. I'm just saying that a lot of the false prophets that we have today, the false teachers we have today, have theatrics going for them, showboating, things like that. And when you start appealing to people's emotions, they have this movement that they do. You know, for, I can't raise my right hand, so you have to forgive me. You know, they throw their hands up, and then they reach for their wallet. It's like a reaction. I don't know how it happens. Because they always come back to money. The root of all evil. That seems to be a common thread today. And in false teaching, if you can tell someone something and change the context of a sentence just enough to get them one degree off, what happens to you? You completely miss where God was taking you. You have to be diligent, he says. They want modern prophets nowadays to tell them what's going to happen next, but they won't get in here and see what Jesus said is coming. Jesus told us right here. It's all written down. It's in a nice book, has a nice cover on it. I even got the super giant print so I can read it. There's no excuse. We know. We just choose not to know. They choose not to know. You know, I love to quote J. Vernon McGee. I wish I could imitate him. But I don't want to do that and get to heaven and have to explain myself. So I'm just going to tell you what he said. He said, the pulpits of America today have turned to giving the flock what they want to hear instead of giving them what they need, the truth. That's a true statement. We see it. That prophetic word that Peter was talking about wasn't these YouTube prophets getting on there and saying, so-and-so's coming back in office. Well, somebody's going in office. We know that. You missed it once. You missed it twice. You've missed it. You've been wrong for four years. That's right. That's exactly right. Peter's telling the flock in verse 16 that they did not take the path of Greek mythology. The, the apostles and the teachers did not go down that road. They didn't take the philosophical road that the Greeks were really known for when they talked about his coming glory and power. He talked to that position because he saw it for himself. He said to them, we did not follow cunningly devised fables. Isn't that what we're hearing today? If you do X, Y, Z, you're going to get X, Y, Z. If you sow a seed of this, that's going to happen. Bless God. I hope he sees the video and has something to say to him. He knows exactly who he is. People are being deceived. Our brethren, sisters, brethren, <laughs> our brothers and sisters are being deceived because people are so hungry for something. They want some kind of assurance. They want a, somebody to tell them it's going gonna, it's gonna to be all right or this is going to happen or that's going to happen that they forget to look in here. Peter's telling them it's going to be all right because Jesus paid for it. If you're following him and you're being diligent, yeah, you're going to have some tough times, but hang on to the hem of his garment. He's got you. And what he's talking about in 17 and 18 it's the Mount of Transfiguration. Can you imagine what that must have been like? To be in the presence of the Lord himself when Moses and Elijah are standing there? Peter told us what it was like. Hey, how about I build a tabernacle for each one of you? You know, Peter, Sadai, Peter with the halo, <laughs> intervenes, inserts himself. But you know what? He's speaking as an eyewitness. Remember we talked about last week, eyewitnesses. They treated that like perjury in court. 
Perjury could get you killed. So telling lies like that, these prophets, these false prophets would go out telling things. And then Peter walks up on the scene and Peter says, I was there. I saw it. I saw and beheld his glory. It was overwhelming. And remember, there were three of them. Peter, James, and John. Jesus always did things with more than one so that people would be able to be witnesses for what happened. He spoke about hearing the voice of the Lord. Can you imagine? Now, I want to ask you a question. I have a a family member that's really dialed in on the Lord right now, trying to hear, trying to hear deeper his voice. Do you ever just stop and get quiet and get alone and listen for his voice? And how do you know when you hear it? When you hear, do you think the devil doesn't know what you're doing? Sure he does, or whoever he's got assigned to you. He knows. He'll whisper in your ear all the day long, won't he? But when we hear our shepherd speak, it moves through our entire body. It doesn't just hit our ears. And when he heard those words from that cloud while they were standing on that mountain, Peter was shaken to his core. And he's sharing with them right here, we heard that voice. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. That same son in whom the father's well pleased is the one that's waiting for you and me. And when we open our eyes on the other side, he's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Aren't you excited about that moment? That's hard teaching that's coming from Peter, but we should think about that. I'm going I'm to give you some hope in just a second. I want you to listen to this, though. In 19 to 21, he talks about prophecy. And he says, there is no prophecy of Scripture that's of private interpretation. Has that changed? How many people are on YouTube right now saying, thus saith the Lord? Do you know in the Old Testament, if you said, thus saith the Lord, and thus didn't the Lord... You were in trouble. Okay, I'm telling the truth. God's reminding me. Thus saith the Lord's for me. That was weird. Prophecy never came by the will of men, Peter says. Never. So be mindful of those who do say, Thus saith the Lord. Be mindful of that. Discern what they're saying. Listen to their message because there is no new prophetic release. He gave it to us right here. This is all we need. The next event to happen is a shout. There's no magic carpet coming to get anybody. There's no UFO that's coming. It's just a shout. Like my grandmama used to do on the back porch. And I will not imitate her because I know my mother will say something to me, but... My grandmother could call out in the whole neighborhood telegraph system lit up with all the ladies going, you better run, boy, you better run. As I was sprinting through everybody's backyard, I knew that call and I knew what it meant. And I was listening for it because I had a general idea when it was going to happen because my stomach would be grumbling. It was usually tied to food. We know the times in which we live because we've studied his word and we see where we are. And Peter said, pay attention to those things and pay no attention to the false prophets, he said. Be mindful. Remember, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, he said. So we have the prophet's word confirmed in his life because he was going to die, just like Jesus said, you will die for my name's sake. And that prophetic word that we've been given speaks as a light that shines in a dark place. See, False prophets don't want you to study scripture. They don't want you to study Revelation. They don't want you studying Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. They don't want you studying the Gospels because they can't manipulate somebody who's got the Holy Spirit teaching them. You will not be moved. You may be shaken and hit, but you will not move because you're grounded in the spirit of the living God. It says, until that day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, until we're standing in his presence... 
until you see him face to face. And that's coming soon. Lawrence Richards said, for those of us who are troubled by heresy or constantly recognize false teachers and cults, this book, 2 Peter, is extremely valuable. It's also helpful to the everyday Christian because Peter calls us to return to the simple godly life and encourages us to commit ourselves to loving God and doing good.